Okay, so here's some of his resume. Dr. Robert Kamansky has passion for art and how it relates to forensics and disorder of perception. He is currently an active community member of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and Homeland Security Information Network. He is the first responder committees of practice and a current member of the California Medical Reserve Corps, MRC, and the California Disaster Healthcare Volunteers. He has been a team leader in rescue and recovery in many national disasters with a certificate in wilderness medicine. He was a biochemistry lecturer at UCLA Center for Health Sciences. Dr. Kamansky has been trained in advanced battlefield pain control and trauma care with certificates given by Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. The art of cosmetic dentistry has always been his passion, starting from his years at UCLA School of Dentistry. Restoration of the human body to its natural artistic state is his core value. Okay, so that is Dr. Robert Kamansky. <laughs> I'm sorry, that just, that just touches on the wait, tip wait, of his Look at all his medals here. I don't know. Can you tell us about some Wait, wait, wait. wait, 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 wait well, go ahead. You can tell us about your medals. Yeah, go ahead. I'm a Cold War veteran, and I was asked to represent 40,000 Cold War veterans and helped to establish the American Cold War Veterans Association. And I was over uh, on Wilshire Boulevard uh, with Wolfgang Grox who was Council General for Germany at the 40th anniversary of the fall of the wall. Mm -hmm. And I represented 40,000, and he welcomed me to Germany and thanked me for unifying Germany, mm -hmm. so he gave me this. Mm -hmm. During my time at UCLA, I worked with uh, NASA and those that put him in on the moon from 69 to 73, uh, and I was given this. Uh, I'm, uh, my wife and I are uh, uh, a president at the President Nixon Foundation leadership people, and Buzz Aldrin, second man on the moon, gave us to us. And uh, this is just the Army, and uh, uh, just, this just, is just, I'm a life the member of the Association of Military Surgeons. I do quality care assessment of Walter Reed and all that. I'm trained in a joint humanitarian overseas command by the State Department, and, uh, and all of that. This is I'm a member of the Army Navy Club, and uh, this is. Uh, something that's called uh, uh, the Military Order of Foreign Wars, Thank you very which is kind of a valor thing. But, so I just wear it to tell everybody the pretty it's not pretty, you know. It's just, it's not, it's just, wow. <laughs> and I also say that my cousin David was on a submarine, and that uh, he was uh, a Russian language expert. He kept he kept us free, too. And I uh, just want to put in a good book for David. That's really He's nice. a hero to me and my wife. I met my wife when I was a second lieutenant. Uh, today, today, I know Natalia and I owe a lot to my wife and for her uh, support in, in doing this. Will we introduce your wife, Anna Bill? Sure. My wife, Anna for the County San Bernardino. And, and I she teach art. A, a lot of art. art. Uh, uh, and she does, uh, yeah, in a classroom in Ontario. Yeah. My mom was an artist, artist, so I do love the arts. Mm -hmm. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank so thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thomas, you had a question? Did you raise no, your Yeah, where's my water? I was, <laughs> 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 well, I'd like to Thanks. introduce Natalia Andewil. Hi. Hi. Come over there. Or, yeah. All right. Um, Natalia is in our mentor program with the California Art Club. Really proud to have her in our program. And her journey as an artist began when she was admitted to the State Art High School for Gifted Children in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Natalia had her first exhibition in her home country at the age of 18. As a teenager, she traveled the United States and the results of the impression America made on Natalia was an exhibition in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Natalia studied at the Academy of Classical Arts in Florence, Italy, where she was able to enrich herself with the treasuries of paintings, drawings, sculpture, and architecture that has since shaped her artistic style. Mm -hmm. Natalia received her Master in Fine Arts from the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture in Kiev, and was captivated with the topic of synesthesia, 
during her MFA research as it is a disease of perception that afflicts many world famous artists such as David Hockney. At the present time, Natalia is applying to graduate school to pursue a career in art, business, mm -hmm. and management. Thank so you. welcome, yeah. Natalia. So happy to have you. Very awesome. I'm so excited. My desire is to not just be an artist and a teacher, but also have a voice in art industry. Because I think what you do is really um, uh, also relates to like what I feel in my heart about because I was trained as a classical artist and traditional art, and I feel like there is so much good art which is not promoted right now and uh, hidden, and, mm -hmm. uh, and and a lot of art which is which is promoted. Uh, like um, I feel that it is something that doesn't like um, have like, God's values, and mm -hmm. I want to be a person who will be um, somebody to introduce uh, like the. Uh, people to a <coughs> great art, the mm -hmm. art that like, brings joy and brings happiness and mm -hmm. not uh, puts down and mm -hmm. depresses. Nice. Yeah. That's, nice. that's yeah. a beautiful yeah. spirit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little nervous because it's my first time giving a speech in English. I've been oh. doing it in my, uh, my language in, in Ukrainian, but... Um, but I'm very happy to be here, very happy to see you, everybody. And um, I just wanted to, you to embrace this uh, whole topic of synesthesia, which is very interesting and uh, it connects our five senses, which is touch, smell, taste, uh, hearing, and sight. And um, imagine if uh, you could taste colors or um, see flavors. Imagine what would you feel if you could if by hearing a sound um, it would stimulate your taste buds. And uh, mentioning of somebody's name, for example, Natalia, will fool your mouth with the orange, like some citrusy tang of orange, or maybe something else. So welcome to the world of synesthesia. Synesthesia is an involuntary neurological phenomenon which affects nearly 7% of world's population and is genetically inherited. Mm -hmm. But um, you can also describe it as um, collaboration between senses or cross-wiring of senses, which makes, uh, for example, letters, words, or um, numbers have colors, flavors, taste, shape, or even personalities. Uh, I'm sure you notice a little bit, a uh, little presentation <laughs> over there in the um, dining room with the synesthetic um, this, um, tra trays, mm -hmm. which is um, kind of my um, idea of how color, uh, taste, and personality could collaborate together. All synesthetes have different, um, um, different synesthetic pathways, so everybody has its own experience. But this is kind of my idea, uh, that uh, green um, um, associates uh, in my mind with Frida Kahlo. Mm -hmm. or a blue with the Salvador Dali, or Mona Lisa with the red color, or Elvis Presley with yellow. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that it's not to be like a very scientific approach, but some kind of um, a play on synesthetic like, perception. And so because only a um, um, handful of synesthetes can really uh, know what it's like to taste blue, for example. And all of us, um, all of the rest of us can just um, experiment and let the imagina our imagination do the rest. I did my research in synesthesia when I was in the master program, but I grew up in a family which consisted of uh, musicians and doctors. And from my early age, I was um, immersed with the uh, artistic stuff and, and visual arts and uh, um, theater and dance and music. And to, to this day, I am very much fascinated with the performances which include all of these kind, um, all of these things together, and stimulate all of the senses, and just be in this atmosphere. It's, it's so much inspiring for me. I uh, decided to do a little research in this area, and the first name that came, um, th which I started with, was um, Russian composer Alexander Skriabin, who was one of the pioneers um, in making um, a performance which is 
orchestrated music and he also orchestrated a light show which will which were um, um, happening along with the performance performing the, his music and um, he designed some special light or um, light organ which was um, uh, really an invention at that time, but only after his death in 1915 in uh, uh, Carnegie Hall in New York was held the performance how he intended during his life, because during his life it wasn't, he didn't see it happen, mm -hmm. and only after his death, um, like American uh, famous orchestra decided to, yeah, to do what he was intended to do. Also, so this, the uh, um, Scriabin, he had synesthesia, this special phenomenon. That's, that's, he would write a note for a special like, um, uh, light show man uh, of what kinds of colors or uh, how the color should move or the pattern, how he sees it in his mind, uh, how, to perform his, uh, how, to, yeah, how to perform his music piece. And uh, since then, I... Uh, did a little research of synesthetes and found out that the majority of abstract artists have this synesthesia. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, their, their art is uh, what they actually see in their mind. It's, you can't I explain, you can only express it. Uh, which was uh, to me um, like a breakthrough because I couldn't understand what actually happens in the uh, mind of the abstract artist. I couldn't understand it. but. Now I feel that, yeah, it's just um, people are born with this different ability to combine all the senses and create something which is maybe not understandable for people who don't have it, but it's very exciting. And uh, I learned from uh, Dr. Robert Kamensky about um, um, super recognizers, people who have um, this unique uh, type of synesthesia called 4D synesthesia, or um, it's also called mirror type synesthesia. Mm -hmm. These people have a special ability to uh, feel somebody else's pain, literally, physically, mm -hmm. on their body. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, they have the ability to recognize faces, uh, facial expressions of other people yeah. on a like, much, better, much better and much faster and on the more like multisensory, deeper level which makes them, I think if I would have such a great ability, it would help me to be maybe a better port portrait, right. like portrait painter. And, uh, I, and also I learned that you can, it actually can be, um, like you can learn how to do this. So that's why I'm so happy to have, uh, like I'm so honored to do this talk with uh, Dr. Robert Kamensky because he, can actually explain how the 3D and 4D facial recognition system works and how it helps artists in their field of uh, expertise. So I... And I'm honored to be with you and all of you. Now, as Anne knows my life, I uh, lectured in biochemistry at the UCLA Medical Center. And I use notes, and it's just the way I do as a scientist. And I will be uh, just describing that fairly quickly. Uh, Face recognition is biometrics. Biometrics involve body measurements and calculations. Face recognition also involves nodal points. Nodal points help with ID protection that we have to protect us when we're at an airport or when we go to a bank. Face recognition technology explained. Face recognition technology, peaks and valleys in our uh, uh, on our face create measurable landmarks in each face known as nodal points. Each person's face is about 80 nodal points, which when measured by facial recognition software created a face print based on a numeric code representing a face in the database. Some features measured by the software are a depth of the eye socket. These are, in adults, these uh, nodal points don't change much. Uh, they also have, have developed skin prints now. So, uh, we'll, yeah, this is an actual biometric facial recognition system at work. Uh, of course, you know it's currently used by governments and private firms and uh, at airports, uh, banks. The, the main thing is to capture uh, the feature. The foremost requirement is to capture the image, and that can be done by scanning existing images 
or using cameras. Then extract, uh, unique facial data is then extracted from the sample, comparing. The data is then compared with a database, then matched. The software then decides whether this sample matches any picture in the database or not, and we've got the bad guy. I wanted to talk about facial expression recognition because with uh, the recognition rate for facial expression recognition is at the highest levels around 97%. And it can either be done in 3D formats or 4D formats. And of course, these are some of the expressions uh, that this biometric system uh, looks for. Uh, next, these are facial anatomical landmarks for a facial nodal point system in which they're measuring the uh, the anatomical uh, landmark of uh, uh, the curves of the uh, eye. Or the now these are the anatomical terms of the different nodal points in order to explain the characteristic of the face. Now in art, nodal points shape the planes of the face in order to explain the character of the face. This is where we're starting to blend forensics and art. Now, because of computer data, the next two slides show how computer data helps artists develop 3D facial sculptures, in this case, a paper sculpture. Here, and the next uh, a slide. Now we have what, what I call a blending. Uh, we see the convergence of art and forensics. Now, with the help of computer graphics, we are now helping uh, the intelligence community and the law enforcement community with their standard artists uh, uh, come up with faces of criminals and also sculptures of <coughs> criminals. We're able to, because of advanced computer data and facial recognition technology, we're able to aid these artists. And they're coming up with a higher recognition rate, I'd say about another 30%. And they make a lot of money. They really do. They're well paid. I, I spent uh, several uh, days in Kansas City with them and also in Sacramento with the California Department of Justice uh, finding missing and unidentified children. That was probably one of the greatest things that I've ever done in my life, was to mm -hmm. find children that had been taken from their parents. Wow. And uh, th th these, the, uh, these next two slides uh, show how this forensics work is done. Of course, now it's aided with computer graphics. Uh, now we have the convergence of machine learning, facial recognition, and art with a Google app comparing your face to a great painting. So we've come full circle. We've come from my science of forensics, uh, and now we are connecting through this convergence with artists. And, and now it is my honor and pleasure to pass the lecture over to Natalia. Thank you. So these are the examples of uh, some of the David Hockney's works, which are the mashups of the, uh, of the faces. And I, he, um, he um, tells himself that he has synesthesia, and I guess um, maybe maybe he has this for dysynesthesia. I'm not sure, but this is the example of uh, how he perceives the like facial expression and faces in his um, in his art. I want you to see this uh, wonderful video, which I think is very which was very fascinating for me because this um, this is about a doctor who feels um, the pain of his patients because he has the special 4D um, expression synesthesia. Mm -hmm. yeah, his name is Joel Salinas, Dr. Joel Salinas. Um, yeah. So this is his book and um, for me it was also interesting that, so he has this mirror type synesthesia and for example if he sees somebody touching the, how do you call the finger? Uh, the point? Index. 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 Index finger. But if, and he feels that, uh, he feels the same touch, like somebody touches him. But if he flips, then it's still uh, the same kind of um, tra trajectory. He feels it in this, you see? In, in, in this thing, which is kind of really strange. But uh, So um, scientists, uh, well, synesthesia, um, combination of senses, but how it, how it works. So our brain has 
different uh, centers. Where each center um, is um, like visual, um, auditory, and sensory, and uh, frontal eye. But synesthesia wasn't really um, very much um, explored yet. Uh, scientists still still don't understand the mechanism of how it works. But the um, theory is that at birth, neural connections between different senses overlap. And in synesthete, some of this overlapping remains into adulthood. So around age four, this like cross-wiring, it kind of they like cut. But for some people, they still um, still cross-wire till their adulthood. In normal development, the connections to the neural regions that control vision and hearing, for example, grow apart by the age of four or so. In dominant theory of the cause of synesthesia is a lack of pruning and continual communication between these connecting regions, known as cross-activation. It's though to be hereditary. The cross-activation between two or more regions allows a synesthete to experience multiple senses at the same time. So this is how the brain, like normal brain and the synesthete's brain. So uh, the research showed that uh, since more, like three times more women uh, have synesthesia than men, and most of them are left-handed. And if uh, somebody has any kind of synesthesia in the family, then there is a 40% chance of somebody in the same family have the same kind of synesthesia or some different type. It's genetically inherited. There are more than, more than 19 types of synesthesia. Multiple artists, such as Vladimir Nabokov, Georgia, Georgia Kifi, and, um, and some others have, uh, have synesthesia. Uh, more women than men inherited more from mother than a father, almost all the time inherited from the mother. This uh, gust lexical gustatory synesthesia, which is somewhere over here, very, very rare one, the one that we kind of experienced at the beginning of the talk. But uh, seeing letters, symbols in color is very, very common. Um, synesthesia, this word comes from the Greek, uh, which is seen to get the aesthetic perception. And this is why you have these small candies in your, it's coming Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. But also just to remind you about um, the connection between shape and taste, how it works. The data is sent from the eye to the visual cortex, which is right here. And uh, usually it, it, it passes like visual to the visual part of the brain. But in synesthesia, like, synest the visual data go through additional areas of the brain that are meant to perceive smell, touch, or sound, or other senses. This is how extra attributes are added to certain things synesthesia sees. Here we see the color sound synesthesia. Um, uh, as I mentioned previously, Scriabin has this type of synesthesia. And um, he, um, he developed this um, like scheme which uh, puts every tone e with the color, corresponds with the color. You can imagine it like a piano. So the brighter, uh, the more vivid and darker color is more like the best uh, the tones. And the brighter, the uh, the brighter color, the brighter sound. Uh, while I was uh, doing my research, I found uh, about um, the research of another um, American scientist called Richard Abbott. And he is, per he is himself a composer, but he decided to um, research synesthesia and uh, he developed this mathematical formula um, which allowed him to correspond, like using mathematical formula, correspond the colors with the um, keys. And here is his kind of idea to identify which, which color uh, corresponds with which uh, key. And then he um, puts it together in a melody because he, he has this special uh, comp talent of composing. He also did it for some, for some famous paintings. And I thought, why, why, uh, like, I want to do something, something like he. But I decided that I would choose um, a musical piece, which I choose the Dvorak 
um, if anybody knows, the Ninth Symphony, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful piece. We will listen to it maybe later. The story of this music piece is um, corresponded with me because I just came, just moved to the United States, and he wrote this a symphony while spending time in California and helping to develop musical school here in, in the United States. And the, um, the expressions of his trip he put into this symphony. And the uh, fourth part of the symphony is called Fuoco, which from Italian means uh, fiery. Uh, also, uh, like uh, we are all artists and uh, um, Cold and warm colors exist in, in visual art, and uh, minor and major uh, notes exist in music, um, which to me corresponds also. And uh, this particular fourth part of the music piece was written in the Mi minor, uh, so the Mi minor, which is the E, but uh, here I, I guess I did the C one. But nevertheless, each uh, tone has the relate. Each key has a relative key in music, minor major, we, uh, which is the same with the uh, painting. You have to have warm and uh, cold colors to um, create something beautiful. <coughs> so this was my uh, master project. You see the red um, sky, which is fuoco, which is fiery. He and she is a symbol of uh, music and visual art because, uh, for example, in Ukrainian uh, we have um, feminine and masculine. So music is feminine and visual art is masculine and their unity kind of like, like is in, in synesthesia opens the opportunity for, to experience something, something exciting, something new and like widens the horizon. And these old people is like a past, so they are kind of like a little bit um, uh, old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. Um, I also was fascinated with this idea of, um, I think they already created this special mechanism, special uh, device that is connected with the brain and allows a person to hear music while seeing colors. This is how the uh, gustatory, uh, 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 gustatory color synesthesia looks like. This is the... Um, well, well, sound, sound gustatory. The interesting thing about the um, seeing, um, seeing music is that some people are associators and some projectors. Uh, so the associators, they simply get a feeling of color when looking at the letter. They think or know the letter has a color, but they will not actually see the color anywhere, so it happens in their brain. And the projectors have the ability to see the actual letter or number in color on the page. Mm -hmm. So this is very popular one, when a type of synesthesia, when colors and number, uh, I mean uh, letters and numbers have colors. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit more rare, but this is the um, testimony of some boy that he, he, who experiences the ordinal linguistic personification type of synesthesia. And he's explaining how he sees each, um, mm -hmm. each, each, like each number, and it is kind of very funny. This is the, how the synesthete sees um, numbers, and this is the regular person, which is sometimes can be very beneficial if you have a task to find twos in the fives, you know? <laughs> this is an example of letter color synesthesia. I would, I mean, if I, if I was in the school, I would love to have such type of synesthesia. You understand why, right? On the vocabulary test especially. In English vocabulary test. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is also a testimony of somebody who has, uh, who can see letters in different colors and taste numbers. Another form of synesthesia, which um, uh, my aunt has, she sees the, she sees the week like she can't can't uh, separate one uh, day from all of others, like a, like a round thing for her, you know. I was reading some um, some blog, which um, this girl is from Scandinavia, and she doesn't. Uh, she kind of uh, wants, to keep, wants to keep in secret who she is, and she calls herself a goldfish. 
while reading her blog, I just fell in love with how she explains her kind of CNS teaching. And I, and I um, got some um, like images that I think uh, correspond with what he describes. So here's what she says. I'm a graphic designer. Color is woven into my thinking. I can't help it. Like plumbers need wrenches, graphic designers need color. Color is probably as significant part of my design work as layout is, if not more. One of the first things our brain notice about an item is its color. We are taught colors very early in school. When I was a kid, I wanted my name to stand for something like jo Roy G. Beef. He was a colorful chap. Mm -hmm. To paraphrase William Gibson's Neuromancer, color is, in quotes, a consensual hallucination experienced daily by billions. He was talking about cyberspace, of course, but it applies just as well to color. The sky is blue, grass is green, oranges are orange. These are accepted facts, correct? But how do we know that your orange doesn't look blue to me? I could see oranges as blue, but still can call it color orange because that's what I was taught. Trying to describe your particular brand of synesthesia to another synesthete is difficult, since none of us have the same experience. But trying to describe synesthesia to those who don't have it at all is nearly impossible. <laughs> it's kind of like trying to describe the color blue to someone who is colorblind. It's, it just really can't be effectively done, but I'll try. I see music in my mind's eye. For example, picture what you had today for lunch. You can see a plate with a sandwich on it, right? But the plate isn't in front of you anymore. It's merely a concept that you can visualize in your mind without actually seeing it. That's how I see music. It's not like wearing virtual reality goggles that block out everything else. On the contrary, I can usually move it to the background when I choose, like a file copying on a computer. It's still there, walking away, but it's not in the foreground. If I choose to let it take center stage, I can but most of the time it's just something going on in the background. Some pretty famous people have synesthesia. A very high percentage of synesthetes turn out to be creative. The guitarist Jimi Hendrix saw music in colors, which inspired the song Purple Haze. Hans Zimmer, Alessia Cara, Lady Gaga, Billie Eilish have synesthesia. It's interesting to me just how many classical composers have been synesthetes, since it's visually the most beautiful form of music. Uh, for example, Jean Sibelius, Oliver Messiaen, George Ligeti, Franz Liszt. I see music in as colors, movement, and patterns. I have a narrow band sound to visual synesthesia, also called music to visual synesthesia, or chromesthesia, meaning that I only see colors and movement in music. Broadband means that you can see any or all noises. The common type of auditory synesthesia is seeing music as color music, to color synesthesia. I have that, but I also see patterns and movement. Sometimes I get little cartoon character dancing around. Sometimes it's like drinking the music. Sometimes it's like watching a pan of water put on top of a big bass speaker where the water jumps in time to the beat. Sometimes it's birds flying or dogs barking. Sometimes it's like moving through a forest. Sometimes all I see is one color in various shades from bright to dark blue. Other music is a whole rainbow. Sometimes it's like looking through a three-dimensional kaleidoscope or being inside a lava lamp. Sometimes I see musical notes crawling across my mind even though I can't read music. Some music moves forward like a road as you can drive on it. Some moves towards me, some moves in spirals and some moves horizontally across my field of vision. Some of it bounces around like a ball inside the box, and some has seemingly no movement at all, like a big sheep moving across a vast ocean. Sometimes it's movement without color, or vice versa. Occasionally, the only way I can describe is it to mix other abstract concepts. For instance, the sound, this sounds like metal. When I say metal, I don't mean the genre of music, but the physical substance with electrical and thermal conductivity, for example, iron or aluminum. Metal isn't exactly known for having a sound, except to me. I can tell you this much. It sounds nothing like a genre. Heavy metal music is misnamed. <laughs> uh, I've often wondered whether the music I like is a result of what colors I like, or if it's the other way around. I wonder whether the fact that I listen to music all day while designing influences my designs. It probably does. 
How much effect does it have on other aspects of my life? What must it be like to hear music and not see it? I guess I will never know since it's such an integral part of me. I can, can't separate it from the rest since it's all I've ever known. I suppose it's the same with the rest of you though. None of us really has a good reason for why we dislike or like what we do. And we can't see the world any other way than our own. The most amazing music to watch is classical. There are so many instruments all working together with different heights and lows that it's a full landscape of visuals. I just sit back, close my eyes and watch the show. It's like going to see a symphony orchestra perform with a complimentary laser light show, except my light show is better than anything <laughs> any light tech could ever design. It's full of color, shapes and movement in three-dimensional space. Synesthete writers often try to incorporate it into our writing, although it is the most difficult medium to use for that purpose, like Vladimir Nabokov, Russian writer. Other famous talented synesthetes include the uh, philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras. Most prolifically and go to greatest effect, many artists throughout history have tried to put their synesthesia on Carlos. Jack Colto, David Hockney, Ciurlioni, Van Gogh, Paul Klee. Depending on which expert you listen to, the Russian artist Vasil Kandinsky mm -hmm. may or may not have had synesthesia. Yes, yeah, some think they don't. Well, he, he told he doesn't have, but he uh, obviously has. Uh, I'm not an art expert. <laughs> I'm not an art expert, but as a synesthete, looking at the painting below is patiently, patiently evident to me that he did. He's widely credited with painting the world's first truly abstract paintings, which in my opinion are comprised of what he saw when he listened to music. There are endless examples of synesthetic art, from Munch the Scream to Whistler's Nocturnes. If I were to paint along with the same music as this artist did, artist did, my interpretation would look entirely different, although Kandinsky's is probably the closest. Not only does he have the symphony of color, but he has almost captured the movement and three-dimensional effect. To me, his painting nearly looks three-dimensional as it as if lower left is the ground and the tower of music is growing out of it toward the right and the top. I can't even be contained, it can't even be contained within the frame. It must be orchestral. I'm not all that fond of most hues of brown, bright orange and yellow. This means that I don't like brown, orange and yellow music. A hint of them as part of a larger work is fine for example, in classical piece, but I don't like songs that are strictly those colors. It might be just as valid to say that I dislike bright orange and yellow music because I don't like the bright orange and yellow. I love music with deep jeweled to tones, rich purpley reds, velvety royal blues, deep emerald greens, and those, coincidentally or not, are also my favorite colors. If I told you it would be impossible to describe and now you probably think I'm crazy. That's fine with me. It's all I've ever known, ever thought, like most synesthetes, I didn't know I had it for the longest time. I didn't figure it out until the band Pearl Jam hit it big in the 1990s. I said that I didn't like them because they're too orange. When I realized that nobody else saw Pearl Jam as too orange, I did a little research. I have a relatively uncommon type of synesthesia. Approximately half of the percent of population have, mm -hmm. has auditory to visual synesthesia, and I've never met anyone else who sees music the way that I do. Whenever I read about other people with synesthesia, there is usually very different from mine. I've tried to paint my synesthesia before, but I'm never happy with the result. The music I see is constantly changing, expanding and moving. It would be impossible to paint the entire song. I could only paint a snapshot. And that's just not good enough for my perfectionist brain. It's a poor excuse for the real thing, but I love looking at what other artists have done with theirs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for... Thank you. How, do they, how do they test for synesthesia? synesthesia? Actually, online there are some tests. For example, um, you can um, you can ask somebody like to to dictate you uh, letters or numbers, and you should um, you should pick the color fast and, and draw it, uh -huh. and then you should put it aside and like return to this uh, and don't look at it for uh -huh. for two weeks, and then do it one more time and uh -huh. then compare, uh -huh. and if you have the same, the result is kind of 
that you have this. But there are online, uh, online different interesting tests. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have a two and a half year old granddaughter that insists everything should be purple. Her clothes, her food. Oh wow, like my, my, like my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Does that have any significance? I don't know. No. Uh, um, maybe it's just a girl thing, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, maybe she has some kind of, of uh, because a lot of people don't realize it until the majority of synesthetes don't even think about it that they are different from others still like a dog. I think little kids have, I, I work with little kids, they have their favorite colors. Yes. I think He's so. Yeah. Yeah. Everything has to be pink. Uh, yes, this kid I'm, glad to green, oh, so yeah. uh -huh. I'm glad that she talked about the, her two and a half year old because mm -hmm. my grandson is four uh -huh. and for the longest time I would tell him, you know, we were playing with blocks and you know, red, green, blue, yellow, so forth, and I'd ask him what color that is, maybe a red block, and he'd say blue. Oh, wow. Mm. You know, and, and then Interesting. did I mm -hmm. change his perception of what the color actually that yeah. I saw? I mean, did I? No, I don't think you can change it if it's there. Mm -hmm. But it's just interesting. Um, maybe he has synesthesia. I mean, I think, like, no, not a lot of people. I didn't know about this until I started my research. And then the other part of it was... Um, Recently, my niece, who I'm very close to, had uh, an operation on her tongue because she developed a tumor. Mm -hmm. And she told us about it in November when I was having a big tamale making party and stuff, and she was there. And she said, I'm going to be operated on in January. I'm, for, I don't know how it happened, but from that day on, my tongue started hurting. Mm -hmm. wow. And mm -hmm. is that a form of that? Kind of. Kind of. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I have a yeah. So there is a whole scale of, uh, is it, um, like for example to this uh, Joel Salinas doctor, he, it's really a huge part of his life. Mm -hmm. It's very intense for him. For some people there are different levels, I guess, yeah. the intensity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, so good to, to have you here. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed our talk and have some something to remind you about our lecture. And you can, yeah, it's finished. <laughs> <laughs>